I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. But no, I really enjoyed it quite a bit. And then I played way too much Dragalia Lost again. <laughs> I'm still very addicted to that game. Yeah? Yeah, it's gotten pretty bad, actually. So there's this game mode, because it's like an event happening. Mm -hmm. And you have to upgrade these facilities like by a, a crazy amount. And you know how I do with progression mechanics. Yeah. I've gotten the like event specialty thing up oh, to level God. 27 of 30 in about <laughs> three days. And then, so you get a couple thousand per run of this thing. Yeah. So I'm currently at 401,794 oh, for this no. like special event currency. And you only get about 1,000 to 6,000 a run. Oh, So shit. I've played way too much of this game. <laughs> Actually, I can tell you approximately how many times I've played one level. 67 times. Oh, man. Yeah. It takes about five minutes to play, too. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John. I'm Brandon. And this is Planet Fay. And there's no good tagline for it. It's just a bunch of fairies flying around. <laughs> it's fair I enough. I like, the, I like the Planet Fay name. I I'm mean, picturing Planet of the Apes, but totally replaced with Tinkerbells. I feel like that's a way w more terrifying movie than Planet of the Apes. Extremely terrifying. Like, if, if there were just a bunch of Tinkerbells. If, like, imagine Dr. Zayas as Tinkerbell. Yeah. All the singing singing people and the, the piano and all that stuff, because I, did, I never actually saw Planet of the Apes. What? Either any of them? I've seen bits and pieces. I think I saw... A, you know what's weird? I might have seen the entirety of Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Really? But none of the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know enough about Planet of the Apes because of the uh, the cultural zeitgeist at this point. Uh huh. And I know enough to know that Escape from the Planet of the Apes is when they kind of start getting weird. Yeah. But that's about all I know about them. Really? All this Planet of the Apes talk makes me want to re-record a version of Rock Me Amadeus, but replace it with Dr. Zaius. Dr. Zaius, Dr. Zaius. You do know that that's a thing, right? No. Yeah, someone that, that's already been done. And not to, be a, not to be a South Park joke, but The Simpsons definitely did it. Oh, no. Yeah, this is actually. Let me. I'm sending you it right now. Oh. They they yeah. definitely did it better. Yeah, they beat you to it. I'm sorry, Brandon. That was in the. Uh, what was that? What season was that? It, it was a while ago. They they beat you to a punchline. That was '90s Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, at the, oh. you know what that means though. You're thinking on the same wavelength as the Simpsons writers, or you just heard the song before. This is our, what, sixth episode? This okay. is our Halloween episode. It is, in fact, our Halloween episode. I, I, I assure you, we're, you just put on a wizard hat. Yeah. Oh, man, I don't have any good costumes ready because I didn't have props ready. <laughs> Always have props ready. I mean, I've got this weird... Uh, just pyramid that kind of chills on my desk. <laughs> so Illuminati I got that confirmed. Going for me. Huh? I mean, yeah. I, I don't know what's on this pyramid. I should probably figure that out. My uncle brought it back for me when he went to Egypt. Oh. And it just kind of existed on my desk. I mean, it's probably the setup to like Hellraiser movie or something like that. <laughs> right? Like, it's yeah. probably like a, it was probably a puzzle box or something. I mean, it's kind of neat. It's like, it kind of looks like they tried to em emulate a Sidian or Basalt type thing. Although I don't think that this is 
actually basalt, just because that seems expensive. Huh. They, I'm pretty sure I know which uncle you're talking about, and it, he's. A, I like that uncle. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, he went to Egypt back a while ago, like 2000. I've had okay. this for a while. I don't know. It just sits on my desk. I like the way it looks. It's, yeah, a, nice it's a cool pyramid. Way. In commemoration of the spooky season. Oh, yeah. Which we really didn't do whole, a whole lot of spooky stuff because we were just kind of launching the podcast. I think the uh, the Dover Demon is pretty spooky. The I devil think so, baby. too. I did. Yeah, he was a devil baby. It, it was, was pretty a devil spooky. Baby. Maybe one day I'll finally animate the uh, the idea I had for the advertisement, but we'll, I won't spoil that. <laughs> I decided that yeah. I was going to do one of my favorite legends in folklore oh, okay. for this episode. Okay, okay, um, we're taking a turn, right? We're going from, from news clippings to, to uh, I'm assuming, old books. Yeah, I, well, it's not that old of a book that I'm looking at right now. I'll show you it when uh, we we go over it. But uh, let's let's try let let's see if you can figure out what one of my favorite folklore le- folkloric legends is. Yeah, hit me with the deets. All right, so it was first cited uh, this particular instance of it in 1577. Okay. It's still seen in modern times. Okay. Its taxonomy is canine. And it's from the British Isles. Okay. That makes me think back to like Hound of the Baskervilles, um, the black dog, the black dog legends in uh English uh the English region at that time. There there's oh, there's a name I'm trying to to remember. It's I'll uh, let you think of the name. It's uh it's right, I think Hound of the Baskervilles was tangentially like is it was, it was inspired the idea was inspired by this creature english black dog it's the the hound it's a it's the hound of oh god uh, uh, clifford the big black dog god damn it you are mostly correct I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you your first W on the old <laughs> stat tracker. So we're at. You're at one of three. Now. Yeah. You didn't get the name of the one we're doing this week, but that's fine because you don't. You were close enough. I it think is it's the black the hound of or the black hound of, and then the name of a a family or area. Yeah, you're pretty much there. Um, yeah. But this week we're going to cover a black dog. Nice of English folklore. There's a lot of them. Oh, I imagine. When I was doing this originally, I thought I was going to do kind of a grab bag type thing. But you did for for fairies. Yeah. But I decided that I didn't really want to do a... Actually, what happened was, as I was working on it, I found a book. Oh. So... It's a blessing and a curse. I found this book. It's called Shock, the Black Dog of Bungay. Okay. Oh, I like the cover. Oh, it's great. It's got a picture of uh, St. Mary's, which is the, the church that this that one of the legends happens in. Yeah. It has a picture of old Shuck in front of it. This is a very interesting story. When I initially started doing research for this, uh-huh. I was originally I was originally looking to do the Grim, the churchyard Grim. I don't know if you ever heard of that. No, it made I never heard of Harry that. Potter. Like double M? Uh, no, single M. I have not heard of that. So it's basically an omen of death oh, for all no. intents and purposes. So if you yeah. see it, while an, uh, a funeral is happening, you're going to die within a year, basically. Yeah. And I really like that legend um, because I have, like, a visceral memory of being afraid of seeing a Grim when I was at, like, uh, a funeral service once. Yeah. Or actually, not so much being afraid. It was more I wanted to see it. Yeah. Because I thought that that would be very cool to see. That'd be crazy. So I have this, like, vivid recollection of this creature. Could a Grim... And when I... Could a grim be any black animal? Because I'm I'm recalling, I think this is in the United States somewhere. There's a town where there's a black cat that it's said that if you see it during like a funeral or a wake, that it means that something bad is going to happen to someone, or, or is is it strictly uh, black dogs? Well, in the case of grims, it's a black dog. Okay. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if there's other mutations of it, like it's in the like zeitgeist, so to speak. Yeah. But 
I, I honestly don't know. And I don't really want to make assumptions and go down that path, but I could totally assume that it has some roots in the same cultural identity in some ways. Because keep in mind, this the story I'm about to tell you predates America. <laughs> By a bit. By, uh, you know, a couple hundred years. So it's entirely possible that these concepts existed a priori to the creation of America. Yeah, and we're brought so over. It, it, yeah, it, it, it follows that. And actually, it makes even more sense once we get into some of the more social and political parts of what this story is about. Oh, nice. I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. Let me give you a brief description of what the what the black dog, or in this case, black shuck, looks like. Okay. Because each of them does have a variation of like how they look. So the Grim has a certain appearance. The bar guests in, I think it's a Scottish form of black dog, uh-huh. they have a specific appearance. Black shuck, he's kind of interesting because I've heard him described in multiple ways, and I found a lot of sources that had different descriptions for him. Basically, black dogs... As it says on the tin, they're black dogs. The type of breed of dog they are, their size, how corporeal they are, eye color, yeah. all those things vary depending on the region, depending on the story. Okay. That being said, there's two key traits. One, they have a black coat. And two, they're dog shaped. <laughs> as the name implies. Uh-huh. These legends have existed for centuries. Yeah. There's some people who hypothesize that it's the result of uh, Norse mythology's influence, Viking influence. Some people say the Romans are responsible. It's some form of Anubis. Uh, There's this whole notion of the wild hunt, which I don't know if you've ever heard of. Oh, yeah. I've heard of the wild hunt. It's also, I believe, one of the titles of one of the Wheel of Time books. It's also the name of the third game in The Witcher. Insta- the third installment of the Witcher series. Oh, okay. For the the games, yeah. but effectively, what the Wild Hunt is, it's like this ethereal, supernatural hunt that moves across the sky. It's a pan European yeah. myth, and I would love to go into it, but I started to scratch the surface of it, and it was just like, this is this is its own episode. I'm not even gonna <laughs> even, I'm not even gonna try to explain all this because you know there's a lot of a lot of implication. Now, all these myths, they vary depending on the region you're in. Okay. Our case, the thing that we're going to be looking into, it is generally centered around East Anglia, around Norfolk. Gotcha. So eastern eastern side of England. Yeah. Okay. Generally speaking, the land is pretty marshy there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's kind of a big part of it, like, you know, in terms of, like, just to kind of give you a sense of the setting. Um there's a lot of river trade that happens in the region, things along those lines. Now, there's a lot of different variations of this story and a lot of different variations of what the Black Shuck is. But I'm going to be focusing more on the omens of death and like servant of the devil kind. Gotcha. Because it's Halloween. Is Shuck the name of the this specific one or is Shuck what a word just a word for something? So that actually brings me to my my uh, my next point. There's a lot of sources trying to unpack what the name Black Shuck is derived from. Yeah, because I There's... only know that related to corn. That's fair. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but that caught me off guard. <laughs> well, that's what you do. You get the green stuff off, you're shucking your corn. Yeah, you got to shuck that corn. Yeah. It sounds dirty. Okay, so Google says, the first hit, corn. The second hit is a person or thing regarded as worthless or contemptible. So it's neither of those. Oh, okay. The first source I found, and I don't agree with it because I was unable to find anything to back it up, which uh, coincidentally, because the way I do this kind of research is I start from Wikipedia to say, okay, show me some sources and then I can fan out. Yeah. Which kids out there who are still in school, that's the real pro tip for how to use Wikipedia. Yeah. Just steal their sources. Legitimately, though, sources from Wikipedia are pretty legit. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, make sure you go to primary sources whenever possible. Yeah. Wikipedia, like in a few websites that I found around the internet, 
claim that it's derived from an old English word, suka or shkuka, something along those lines. I don't I don't have a pronunciation guide in front of me, which means devil or fiend. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So would that be so it's like the first part of succubus. I'm thinking yeah. of like yeah, like it's, suka it's, to succubus isn't a huge jump. Yeah, it, it's spelt S C U C C A. Oh, uh, there's a there's a first there's a sneaky C. Yeah, it's got one of those sneaky C's. The the more believable meaning of shuck, in my opinion, is yeah. it's Norfolk slang. Okay, I dig it. And that slang is for shaggy. Okay, that tracks. So right, shaggy dog, I get it. The shaggy yeah, dog yeah. stories. So shuck. Okay, exactly. They call it like the shucky dog, old shuck, old shock shuck bunch of things along those lines yeah okay this is all tracking i like it yeah i actually like that that's my favorite idea for what to call the old chuck or black chuck is yeah is, it's like a shaggy dog it's a black shaggy dog because uh -huh. in fact most descriptions of it involve it being a shaggy dog right like, on that's just the way it's described the, the place the that black i black shuck sorry to cut you off but is the it's black fine. shuck itself a shaggy dog, like the shaggy dog stories. Like, what do you mean the shaggy dog stories? So, uh, as in a, like a shaggy dog story is like a a long rambling. It's like a uh, really long joke, but you don't realize it's a joke till you've already like they've wasted five minutes of your time. And so, it's like just the aristocrats. Totally absurd. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't call the aristocrats a shaggy dog. Actually, know what it might it might be. It might actually be a shaggy dog. It's just an extremely dirty shaggy dog. Yeah. Like really dirty. He played in the mud for a while. And it turns out it wasn't mud, but a septic tank. <laughs> and there were five dogs. And then they did a whole like trapeze ass uh, act. And then <laughs> I like trapeze ass better. <laughs> trapeze ass. They did a trapeze ass. And then somebody walks up and talks to the person who's watching the dogs because apparently it's the dog's owners and he doesn't really give a shit. And the person's like, so what are your dog's names? They're the aristocrats. <laughs> Not the aristocrats, aristocats. Ah, yeah. That was a bad joke. That was a really bad joke. <laughs> that went nowhere. Let me get back to, to the fact. The first recorded instance that I could find of Black Shuck was in a 1850 article in the Quarterly Scholarly Journal. And it was called, uh, it was uh, Notes and Queries was the name of the um, the journal. Okay. And in the article in question, it was called Shuck the Dog Fiend. I don't remember. I forgot to write down who wrote this, but um, I'll just read you a little bit yeah, of a It sounds of. like a, a Magic the Gathering card. Shuck the Dog Fiend. It's a pretty good name. I won't lie. Yeah. Like, it's it's imposing. Although, it might be very funny to someone who shuck is the Norfolk slang for shaggy. Shaggy the Dog Fiend. <laughs> Wait a second. Is Shaggy the Dog Fiend Shaggy from Scooby-Doo? He may be. He has a preternatural ability to eat food. Yeah. To the point that it's actually kind of demonic. The same food as his dog, by the way. Frequently. Yeah. I'm worried about Scooby's liver. I'm worried about Shaggy in general. That's fair. I think that dude... That dude burnt himself out somehow. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. I, I don't wonder know how, how it could have happened. It's a mystery. I mean, he's never smoking on the show, ever. Ever. There, there's a lot of off-screen stuff going on, I suspect. My favorite thing about uh, Scooby-Doo, and this is kind of on point because it's, you know, a mystery show about ghosts and monsters. But my favorite thing about Scooby-Doo is that for years, the creators have asserted that they knew nothing about the implications of, like, weed culture and stuff along those lines. <laughs> They're full of shit. Those yeah. guys were full of it. For years and years and years, they've, they've been like, no, we don't know anything about that. Also, interesting fact, um, Shaggy, since... Who was it? Who was Shaggy's voice actor? Oh, I know, I know his name. 
Uh, um, Casey Kasem? Yeah, it was Casey Kasem forever. Yeah. Except yeah. for one. I think it was Casey Kasem in everything except for one item, and then it went right back to Casey Kasem. If I recall correctly, I could be misremembering, but in the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, they didn't show any smoking of the stuff. Mm-hmm. But I think there might have been a scene where Shaggy and Scoob get out of the van and there's just a haze inside the van. So there is an implication of something, but they never actually showed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, uh, Casey Kasem. Yeah. He was a uh, vegetarian. Okay. Yeah, and he made a demand that Shaggy never ate meat on screen. Oh, that's cool. So, I like that. After after the first initial original series, when Casey Kasem like basically made this demand, yeah, um, for years Shaggy has been a vegetarian. Right on. Yeah, uh, there's a few instances where he's not one, but you know this has nothing to do with Black Shuck. I just thought it was an interesting Scooby fact. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so this this is an excerpt from uh, Shuck the Dog Feet. This phantom, I have heard many persons in East Norfolk and even Cambridgeshire describe as a black shaggy dog with fiery eyes of immense size and who visits churchyards at midnight. One witness nearly fainted away at seeing it, and on bringing his neighbors to see the place where he saw it, he found a large spot as if gunpowder had been exploded there. Oh, damn. A lane in the parish of Overstrand is called, after him, Shuck's Lane. The name appears to be a corruption of shag. As Shucky is the Norfolk dialect for Shag- Shaggy. It is not a vestige of the German dog fiend. Oh, is this not? <laughs> Sorry. O- older English is shitty to read. Yeah. Is not this a vestige of the German <laughs> dog fiend? Wow. Yeah, I like so, it. I can totally see. Because Shaggy has... There's the the glottal, like the hard glottal G right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I can totally see, because I think this is a a frequent thing with a lot of slang anywhere, is to just remove that and you just say shuck, which will shorten it, and you hit the hard uh, uh, CK, and you don't have to go from that glottal in the middle to the Y at the end, because it's a weird weird mouthfeel. Shaggy. Yeah, I can see that. Shaggy versus shuck? It's an easier thing. Yeah. To say. It's much easier to say. So, anywho, from this, we can kind of draw a few things, because this is the first instance of Shuck in any form of modern literature or modernity. Uh Uh-huh. There's a few key points that we have to take into account about Shuck when we're trying to identify a Shucky dog. Okay. So, one, it's from Eastern England, so the Norfolk area in general. Two, it's generally associated with churchyards and some kind of supernatural fire or conflagration, something along those lines. Yeah, cool-ass eyes. Yeah, and three, the eyes are glowing red. Oh, okay. (laughs) Which is a very, very common description for it. There is one interesting point to make. Yeah? In some of my sources, it was described as having only a single eye. Okay, that's kind of neat. Was it the left eye? No, no, no. So it's like a single eye, kind of like a cyclops. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then some stories talk about it like shape-shifting and things along those lines. So it can't be eye shine because this is pre, like, flashlights. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... Well, I mean, I guess firelight or what what have you. Yeah, but it's less likely to be eye shine. It's another instance of glowing red eyes popping popping up again. Glowing red eyes are a very common motif in basically all cryptid stories and all folklore and things along those lines. And honestly, I think a lot of it comes from eye shine, right? Mm -hmm. So this is me hypothesizing. So don't take this as fact, everyone. It's a fact. (laughs) Don't, no, no, The the following is fact. No, it's not. It is all fact. This is John trying to make sense of something (laughs) with, you know, me sitting literally in an armchair. (laughs) <laughs> this is me armchair folkloring. <laughs> I have a hypothesis. Okay. About why I shine is so like ingrained into our cultural identity when speaking about things that are paranormal and supernatural. Mm-hmm. Imagine you're a caveman. Well, a recent <laughs> caveman. Not the Geico caveman? No, they don't count. Okay. They got canceled pretty quick, to be fair. 
I because, forgot hey, that was a show. Yeah, it was a show. Because, you know, hey, how many times do you think, oh, you know what? I'm going to record a campaign. Uh, I'm going to take a, a successful commercial and turn it into a TV show. That's not going to happen. And it happened. It happened. Well, what, with their Roy Scop. It, did, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it happened. Su- successful is the operative uh, word that didn't, didn't yeah. quite make it. Whether it happened or not is not a question. It did happen. But anywho, the, the the core point of my argument and what I'm trying about to say is imagine you're a caveman, right? Okay. Or done. a nomad of some kind. Uh-huh. I've got a you're cave. Sitting I've at got a, fire. a painting. I've got drawings of buffaloes on the wall with blood. I'm sitting by a fire. Um, uh, 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 Michael Sarah is here next to me. Are you Jack Black? Yes. Okay. So imagine you're a Jack Black caveman. <laughs> Which actually, this works pretty well because this would fit. This is up right up Jack well, Jack Black's wheelhouse. So imagine you're sitting at a fire, and all of a sudden, you start to see these little two pricks of light at the <gasps> edge of the fire. eyes. <gasps> Meanwhile, Michael Sarah's in the corner, just shyly mumbling. <laughs> so while Michael Sarah's shyly mumbling, Michael Sarah, caveman, is mm-hmm. not afraid of the eye shine. Right. Oh, yes. Which is counterintuitive because usually Michael Sarah caveman would not be, but it's from that movie where he he had a mustache. <laughs> so it's it's Michael Sarah with a mustache, so he's all super confident. So he walks out of the the firelight. Michael Sarah gets eaten. Jack Black, who is afraid of the eye shine, does not. So now what happens is, in terms of our survival as a species cavemen who are afraid of eye shine continue to live yeah cavemen who are not afraid of eye shine die out yeah no that that totally even that that ties back into the the global fear of snakes that seem just inherent in everybody and the same probably goes for spiders we haven't done a spider episode but but nobody likes spiders except weirdos and spider-man he i don't think spider-man likes spiders he puts them on all his clothes (laughs) <laughs> he puts the web on he puts their house on all their clothes he has no he has his little spider the spider on his shirt i played a lot of spider-man video games <laughs> i've read the spider-man comics i keep bumping my mic stand <laughs> i get animated you get me animated with these things <laughs> well i see <sighs> you've, you've been doing jazz hands okay so <laughs> anyways getting back to black shuck I actually found another source on uh, archive.org. Nice. Shout out to archive.org, saving me money all of the time. Yeah, for real, actually. Definitely, 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 if you're trying to do research, plug it into archive.org, and it might be able to give you something interesting. Or, better yet, uh, if you have a local library, visit it and support them. Yeah, well, I'm already supporting that. That my taxes plate for the, the the library, but the library doesn't provide me the text file of the scanned copy of the original book. They text actually files might, are searchable. They actually might be able to provide you that. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm not even joking. Libraries are freaking cool, man. Oh shit! All right. Yeah, yeah. No, don't knock libraries. They're they're pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> also, librarians. They I think they have to have a master's degree. Really? In library science? Yeah, they're like really? pro researchers. Like, no joke. They're phenomenal. They make what we do on this podcast look like amateur hour. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that about the uh, ye old librarians. Oh, yeah, no. I, I'm going to take this. This podcast has now become a platform. Support your librarians. They're cool ass people. <laughs> so, anyways, this, this, this book called Ghost and Witches. It was written by an author named Day J. Wentworth. <laughs> I like the I, name. Yeah, I, I think he has a descendant who makes uh, commercials with Viking women. But I'm not sure. <laughs> In this book, which it's a little bit strangely written, but I think it was a, a slightly older text. Uh-huh. I, I don't have the, the published date in front of me. But um, it tells a tale of an iteration of the Black Shuck, which walks around headless. Oh, okay. Near, uh, That's out of nowhere. Bridge. Oh, yeah. 
No, it, it's kind of insane because I was I actually found this website called like Shuckland, I think it was. <laughs> Sounds like the worst version of Disney. Oh, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna link it in the show notes and I'm sending it to you right now because this website looks like it's straight from ninety five at best. Oh, is it been is oh I hit the wrong button. Uh I sent it to you. Oh, I accidentally did a, a temporary screen share. <laughs> I don't see it. Oh, because I canceled it. You wouldn't have seen anything okay. bad, but <laughs> All the, the porn. Button. All the porn. Okay, Shuckland, I dig it. They got some some pictures of dogs. They've yeah. got um not to bash their website, but it could stand to be updated. If you uh go to the bottom, website originally published January two thousand five. Oh, okay. The person who published it also has the name of a United States representative. So yeah, it walks around headless in Norfolk, England. Uh huh. Although sometimes there's a head. <laughs> the the story was not a hundred percent clear. I'm I, sorry I for confused. for the random laughing, but I just remember that joke where it was, my dog has no nose. How does he smell? <laughs> This is also the second instance of Black Shuck being uh, considered an omen of death that I was able to find. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's a common occurrence. like uh-huh. Or not a common occurrence, a common motif in the Black Shuck story for it to be uh, associated with death and all those sorts of things. There's also... I, I love this book. <laughs> there is also a section where a woman by the name of Sophia Wilson wrote the author of the book a letter okay. talking about their their black shuck sighting. Yeah. It's three full paragraphs. And when I say paragraph, I mean like large paragraphs. Like old three timey full, paragraphs. Yeah, old timey paragraphs. Not high school this is the minimum that would count as a paragraph on the essay paragraph. Yeah, it's not four sentences. Gotcha. In her her letter, she basically says my son saw Black Chuck once. He disappeared. Oh, whoa. Okay. That's the entirety of the letter. <laughs> they just flowered it up a bit. They flowered it up a lot. <laughs> I, 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 I read that letter, and as I'm reading that letter, I'm like, at this point in my research, I'm panicking. So yeah. this was about two weeks ago. Where I'm like, how the fuck am I going to turn this into an, a full episode? <laughs> like, I legitimately was getting concerned. Yeah. Because, like, so many of the stories are literally, I saw a big black dog. <laughs> you saw a big black dog. It disappeared. It's a black dog. It's night. It just ran. <laughs> Anywho. Uh, but... Like, as I read more, I found out about a few other things, which we're about to get to. In this book, Ghosts and Witches, yeah, they make the assumption that Black Shuck can be traced back to Norse mythology. Because, if you remember, this is on the east coast of England. Gotcha. What did the east coast of England have a problem with? Vikings. <laughs> so... There's some there. There's uh, a possible tie back in there. There's there's a legitimate reason why there would be a tie into Norse mythology, being that the the Viking raids or or what have you, and that they may have some may have stayed behind, and then the the cultures intermingle. Bada bing, bada boom. You've got yourself a shuck. Yeah. So there's two problems I have with this theory. Okay. Problem one. There's really only two dogs associated in Norse mythology, Gary and Freke, which both mean ravenous, the ravenous or greedy one. Gotcha. They were they were Odin's pets, and they're basically carrion eaters on the battlefield. Yeah. Gary? Which, Did you say is Gary? Jerry. Like G-E-R-I. I don't know how to pronounce that. Jerry. Name. Jerry. <laughs> uh, listen. Cool name. Listen. For your if war dog. If you're well, it means it means greedy one, the ravenous. It's actually a pretty cool name for the for your uh, <laughs> war dogs. This is Tina the Destroyer. That would be a phenomenal war dog name. <laughs> like not even joking. Mm-hmm. If I saw Tina the Destroyer, I would 
I would just put down my weapon and let what what happens happens. <laughs> but the other problem with this, and this is a big one, a Tudor England farmer is not going to know about Norse mythology. That, you're lucky, that sounds true, yeah. You're lucky if a Tudor England farmer knows enough about their own religion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not knocking them. They were subsistence farmers and they were working. Yeah, they're busy. They were working. Yeah, like they're a lot. extremely busy. Yeah. So just, just sheerly the fact of the matter is they're just not going to know as much about stuff like that because they don't have the cycles. Yeah. Like the second, the, the only reason we have time to do this podcast is literally because farming has become so automated. Yeah. And we don't oh, have yeah. to be farmers. That's I it. I would never make it as a farmer. You were pretty farmer adjacent for a while. Actually, that that is true. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to say that you were pretty farmer adjacent, like for a good couple of years. Yeah. At least the entirety of college. Yeah. Now, my primary source for this episode, and we're about to get into it, and it's a phenomenal, phenomenal story. Shock the Black Dog of Bungay. It's a pretty small book, uh -huh. uh, about 140 pages. It was written by um, Dr. David Waldron and Christopher Reeve. The, it's a really good book. The Christopher Reeve? Uh, I think he's a Bungay local. Oh, I got you. Not Superman. So this book is phenomenal. And I totally agree with their assessment that saying that this is either related to the Wild Hunt, Anubis, Kerberos, Norse mythology, all those things, that's that's totally reductionist. It, 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 redu it takes away all the it takes away all the weight of the story. Because yeah. there's a lot of cultural context to this story that is not these things. Now, keep in mind, these things might have eked their way into other areas, but it should be noted that, in general, there is a tendency for dogs to be associated with death. That is actually a thing. Oh, yeah. Um, because oh, dogs yeah. are dogs are carrion eaters. They'll eat yeah. dead bodies. Well, you've got Anubis, you've got Cerberus... You've got there, there. There's a ton of examples of dogs being associated with death or the underworld or or, yeah. or similar uh, items. And the fact of the matter is, you go to somewhere like South America, like Aztec Mayans, they yeah. also consider dogs to be psychopomps. Okay. And what's a psychopomp? Those... Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, those are guides of souls. So, like okay. the Grim Reaper is a psychopomp. Anubis is a cycle. It's also my favorite word. It, ever. It's pretty fun to say. It's pretty great. And there's some pretty awesome imagery if you Google psychopomp, which I totally recommend. But that's a key point. So one of the reasons Black Shuck is associated with death is most likely because dogs are associated with death. Yeah. And a spooky dog that disappears and has glowing red eyes, well, it's not hard to see how the association happens. It's an easy one to make, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the core subject of this book that I read is about a particular Black Shuck story, which the author of this book doesn't really consider it to be a Black Shuck story, mm -hmm. and that's largely because the there's a lot of cultural context in this particular story. Yeah. But I personally think it's... I think it can be categorized as one just because it fits the description of the 1850 myth story. Gotcha. So... Let me tell you about Bungay. Bungay. It's a riverside <laughs> town in Easter England. It's not Bungay's brother? It's not Bungay's brother. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not Icy Hot's brother either, but it is its cousin. Oh, okay. Yeah. But not, not Bungay. <laughs> They're not on speaking terms. Here, it's Bungay undercover. No, that's the other no. guy. I'm Bungay. Bungay's my cousin. God damn it. He has a mustache. Uh, so how does a town have a mustache? A town? <laughs> oh, because this is a town. Yeah, there was a guy wonder... that was caught shoplifting once, and let's just say an item was removed, and now it's kept at town hall. Oh boy, I, I don't even want to know. It's a riverside town in eastern England, Norfolk, which in seventeen in fifteen seventy seven, 
which is when this story took place. It was largely, its economy was largely based on river trade in the production of hemp. Nice. Well, it was it was for sales for the river. Blaze it. Over the years, it would slowly become more and more of a hub for the, the region. And it, it's kind of weirdly like in that unique space where, because it's on a river, it has like, it's kind of like the central point of the East Anglian region. Yeah. Because it kind of links a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of depth on that because I fully recommend anyone who's interested in learning more about the town of Bungay to pick up this book because it's a phenomenal read. I blasted through it in like two days. Right on. Speed reading. I, I loved it. It was really good. I've marked up so many pages with notes. The event in question happened on August 4th, 1577, which apparently I think was a Sunday. I probably should have looked that up. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is the like last year of tutoring. That day, a massive thunderstorm hit. Massive. Absolutely huge. In Tudor England... A thunderstorm was bad because most of the houses had thatch roofs. Oh, uh, yeah. So in Tudor England, if there's a thunderstorm, God fucking hates you. <laughs> <laughs> Just Make as a rule. Just as a rule. Yeah. So there's a story that survived from... 1577 oh, and right it's a on. pamphlet it's a pamphlet that was produced by abraham Fleming. the okay. pamphlet in question was called a strange and terrible wonder strange and okay who is this by again albert albert hum- humphrey abraham Fleming. he was a, a... <laughs> I, I wasn't even close abraham no, not Fleming. even close i literally okay. just said it too um <laughs> So Abraham Fleming was, uh, he was an Anglican preacher. So at this time, this is about when the Anglican church got made a little after the fact because of Henry VIII wanting to divorce his wife yeah. largely. So they split off from the Catholic church. It adopted a lot of things, but it dropped a ton of things. So like, I think a lot of the, the structure of the church remained the same, but they removed, um, uh, what did they get rid of? They got rid of like a lot of the trappings. It was a mo- it was much more Spartan church. Gotcha. Which is in, okay. it's an important fact. According to Abraham Fleming, the congregation of St. Mary's Church in Bungay was engaged in worship during this thunderstorm when a formless shape of darkness descended upon the church. Oh, right on. As this this formless shape descends upon the church, it slowly kind of morphs into this giant dog huge like yeah. seven feet tall glowing red eyes nightmare creature <laughs> literally a hellhound yeah in fact black dogs are kind of the inspiration for like the dandy hellhound so as it runs in it just kills two people like that instantaneously <laughs> just snap snap dead yeah and then a third person gets permanently disfigured Oh, by this God. creature. Like, uh, is, I think are there specifics? It, it, it described him as curling as leather or something of oh. that effect. Like oh. he got like the way I'm imagining it is he gets struck with this this crippling disease where he like instantly is like unfit to work. Yeah. Which in once again, wow. Tudor England, any form of crippling Not great. Not great. As it leaves, it burns the door to the church with its claws. Um, that's metal. And then runs 13 miles away to the nearby town of Blightburg. Blight, that's not a great name. It's, it's a name. Um, and there's a church, there's a church called the Holy Trinity there. Uh Dog does the exact same thing there. Kills another two men and birds a third. Then leaves claw marks as he goes. Shoot. He's got a calling sign. Oh yeah. So this dog kills two four men maims two permanently and the language that abraham fleming uses is very hellfire and damnation which is to be fair a like hallmark of the anglican church and puritanism at that time yeah this black dog or the devil in such likeness god he knoweth all who worketh all 
running along the body of the church with great swiftness and incredible haste among the people in a visible form and shape passed between two persons as they were kneeling upon their knees and occupied in prayer as it seemed. Wrung the necks of both in one instance, leaned oh, backwards damn. in so much that they that at a moment where they kneeled, they strangely died. Damn. I want to point out that was a single sentence. Yeah, not 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 top uh, on top of that punctuation. Yeah, it's pretty vicious the way he describes this because it's like the devil in such likeness, basically. Yeah. And then he immediately he immediately follows it up with God. He knoweth all who worketh all. Like, oh. like even mentioning the devil needs to be addressed. Yeah. Like in and, and, and like warded off in some way. Shoot. It, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. So, and, and there's 14 pages of that. Like, not even joking. <laughs> I'm not gonna read the whole thing just because yeah. there's literally 14 pages of this, or at least the original pamphlet was 14 pages, and it's uh-huh. not easy to read. It's not a it's not a fun read. It's tutoring. This dog is still said to haunt the area, though, to this day. He can be found in Bungay Castle, Bigod's Way. In the graveyard of St. Mary's, the very church that this event occurred in. Oh, right on. Yeah. Many people still claim to see this dog and claiming it to be an omen of death. Is this like a regular instance or an, an, a random thing? Like every every third Wednesday or every Friday the 13th if you go here at midnight? Or is it just you have a chance of seeing this dog? It's more or less a random thing. Although okay. it's been said that like people see it all the time. And when gotcha. I say all the time, I mean, like, there's one story in this book about a, a man who was with the American army at an army base. Yeah. And he saw it in, like, the the uh, the airplane hangar or something like that. Oh, shit. It might have been Air Force. But there's one interesting story where someone was talking about cycling, and uh-huh. they see a giant dog in the middle of the road, so they stop, and a car yeah. comes, like, cruising oh. through, and yeah. the dog just, it goes straight through the dog, and the dog's still sitting there, and then... In an instant, gone. Ah, oh, I like it. Although that being said, about two years later, his wife did die because you know the black the black dog's an omen. Yeah. <laughs> By these accounts, it seems like this dog is some kind of specter, demon, devil, or something along those lines. Yeah. However, yes, this is a big however. People claim that this is a uh, a corporeal dog. Like like an evil corporeal dog, or just they're explaining it as a regular dog? They're explaining it as a regular dog. Okay. So in 2004, and I, I think I sent you the link uh, in the chat for the yeah. document. Uh-huh. So in 2004, 20, 2014, sorry, archaeologists found the remains of a large dog entombed in the abbey grounds of the Lyston Abbey, which is about eight oh. miles from Blytheburg. Yeah. So this is only a few miles away from this location. So some people claim that because there's this giant dog that existed, that this was a dog that performed these murders. Oh, they think it's a singular specific dog that was just a bad dude. And then they locked him away in an abbey nearby. Yeah. It was buried alive or something along those lines. And the the image of the dog is like, you know, the the skeleton is pretty, pretty uh, interesting. It's a huge dog, by all accounts. That's pretty big. I see the picture with, uh, yeah. uh, of him in the hole in the ground, and that's just like it's just a part the, of the spine. Yeah, that's just a part yeah. of the spine, and then like either shoulder or hind portion. So that's only like less than half of the dog. Yeah, it's that a looks pretty big. Yeah, it's it's a pretty big dog. That is impressive, but <laughs> ah, crap. I was just about oh, to get to the good part. They're not happy. No. I, I don't know what I did this time, but it was not good. I think you know what you did. That's not true. I never know what I do. <laughs> Today's sponsor is Incredisol. Incredisol is the newest shoe and boot protective liner in the industry. Incredisol is chemical resistant and slip resistant. The newest feature is the tread replicator technology. These incredible protective liners come not only in a wide variety of sizes, but you can order your treads to replicate any of today's most popular shoe brands. Leave the next guy wondering, who could have been here in those snazzy shoes? 
they'll never know they were in Critisol. Now back to the show. I think you can start to see how this story has kind of been haunting my brain. Yeah, bit. it's a good story. I, I do really like it, and it ties in. I like that this branches out in a lot of other directions, and that there's a lot of other Black Dog stories, and this could sort of tie in st- at least somewhat to the origin of those. Yeah, it, it's it's wild. There's just there's so much on Black Dogs. Like, if you go to the Wikipedia page for it, which, you know, Wikipedia... Wikipedia gets a weird, bad rap for, you know, being a bad source of information, but it's actually, like, amazing. Because it gives you enough... I will say that while they're... The pages themselves tend to be shorter, Mm -hmm. they do next to things, you'll see, like, a little number, and you can click on it, and it shoots you right to the the original uh, text that it came from. And yeah. you can just go try to find your original text through that, and it's they they do their citations really well. It's really useful, actually. But, you know, as with everything, it's a tool. You have to make sure you use your tools properly. Yeah. And you have to make sure you don't fall into hoaxes, which is very important in this story. Oh, no. Did someone try to fake a black dog? Well, no. The story in question that I was telling, to you, telling you before uh, we got interrupted by management... So rudely. Yeah, a little rudely. That particular story, it didn't really come from the most reputable source. Oh, where's this one going? So that story came from the Daily Mail. (laughs) (laughs) I've linked you the article in the in the Skype chat. Um, the one there's a really. Fucking hilarious picture of uh, a black dog on that article. <laughs> yeah, you know what the black dog looks like? It looks like the same. You, you know the Spanish lady who there was a church that had a painting of Jesus, and she thought that it needed to be touched up a little bit. It looks like she she painted this black dog. It really does. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to knock people's artwork, but at the same time, like. It's it's very very funny. The article as a whole as a whole is kind of it's 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 questionable. There's been some assertions that have made that kind of assume that this whole thing was actually a publicity stunt to try and gain money for the the dig. Oh, um, I didn't find any follow ups on it, so I'm not gonna like spread i'm gonna try and be careful about not spreading like you know entirely entire conjecture about this and i should be very careful about that but there is a lot of there's no real good reason to believe that this the black dog of bungay yeah just because that's also keep in mind this is 21 miles away from its original location Uh uh-huh so looking at that picture that was linked Mm -hmm. if you look at it there are I don't know the name of of bones, but there's your what you'd expect to see in your typical um, dig site as far as how you would see the bones before they're exhumed from the ground. And there's clearly two large, I'm going to say femur because to me that's what they look like, but two large bones that move horizontally in the picture that are completely clean and there is not any dirt on them. So if you look at the spinal column, it's resting on top of some dirt where all the Mm -hmm. dirt around it was um, cleaned away, but they're leaving it there to preserve it. There's clearly a few bones that look like they were placed back on top for that image. And they're the exact type of bones that are in the blue bin to the left of the picture. So it looks like they at least found something and then for the picture, added some more bones on top of it to take yeah, the picture. I, I don't know about that, but the, the they definitely found a dog. Yeah. And here's the other thing. There are big dogs, like really big dogs. Oh, yeah. So it's not like it doesn't have to be supernatural. And Occam's Razor kind of tells you it's probably not supernatural. Yeah. But, you know, it's still an interesting story, I think. I, oh, I didn't really read. I like once I, once I realized like once I questioned the source, I really wasn't quite 
willing to put too much research into that. Yeah. Um, just because I, I heard about it and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Then I went to dig into it and I'm like, eh, I don't know if I really believe this. And on top of that, the actual research that the archaeologist did made no ne- mention of Black Shuck. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is one of those things where they punched it up for the sake of selling tabloids. The Daily Mail? No, no, no. <laughs> but also, this kind of leads you to question the original story a little bit. And it doesn't actually follow that just because there's no evidence that it's instantly fake. But yeah. what does follow is 1577 was during like the turmoil of the, the Reformation period. Uh-huh. So that's, you know, as I was saying before, when Henry VIII switched from the Catholic Church over to the Anglican Church, and Puritans started to gain a lot of power. Yeah. Puritanism versus Catholicism resulted in a lot of conflict in England in this time period, particularly in Bungay, where there's several stories that are featured in this book of conflicts between the more Puritan individuals in the community and the more Catholic Catholic, the more Catholic <laughs> individuals in the community. A key thing to note is, you know, because not everyone who listens to this might be as familiar with like the differences between Catholicism and Puritanism and all those types of things. A key trapping of Catholicism is, you know, like the stained glass windows. The uh, there's a lot of ritual involved. Yeah, a lot less ritual is involved in Puritanism, Protestantism, all that that kind of stuff. But during the Reformation period, the Puritans wanted to take away the trappings because they just wanted people to focus on the word of God. Yeah. The problem is a lot of those trappings were there for the illiterate congregants. Yeah. No, that <laughs> makes sense. Right. Uh, Cause at that time the priest was the only one that could actually read frequently yeah. or sometimes not even the priest. A lot of those trappings were there for the sake of people who couldn't really process it. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things where everyone has their own belief systems and their different thoughts. And I, I don't want to knock any one person, but you know, when people believe something, just leave them alone. I mean, unless they're one of those people who say that the prequels were better than the original trilogy. <sighs> you know, there's a lot of people who are just like slightly younger than us who definitely believe that. <laughs> I'm not joking either. That's definitely the case. No. I mean, look at our look at our pre- prequel memes. Really? Yeah. Have you been there? It's on I'm Reddit. just saying a, a high fantasy set in space is better than like a political drama with a lizard boy. That's fair. Although that being said, the the lightsaber fights were cooler in the prequels. Yeah, man. But let's let's move on from Star Wars facts. <laughs> so contextually, this is important in the story of the Black Dog of Bungay. Uh-huh. Because at the time of the story, there was a lot of conflict, as I was saying. Let's make let's try and put two and two together here. There's a lot of speculation that it might have been Puritan neighbors oh. framing their Catholic neighbors. Oh man! Oh, or, man. That's yeah. so good. Because, all right, they got struck by lightning. Two people actually died. <laughs> um, that's in the records. John yeah. Fuller and Adam Walker died uh, when they were the, the, the church tower was struck by lightning. Which yeah. did severe damage. And not only that, the church ledger notes that they're, like a year later, it notes that it was a terrible storm. Oh, that, okay. That, when it happened. In the church ledger itself, not just one of the pamphlets? No, not in the pamphlet. This is in, like, the actual church ledger. Oh, man. The Blythburg, the Blythburg church ledger got destroyed, and w- there's no evidence of that, but the, the Bungay one has yeah. evidence of this happening. But it has no mention whatsoever of the Black Dog, which is key, because that's a big thing. Yeah, that's that's a pretty big one. So there's no evidence of the Black Dog Bungay anywhere outside of Abraham Fleming's account. And Abraham Fleming is a Puritan preacher. Oh. 
so he jumped. He he might have jumped at the opportunity to have a yeah. morality tale, basically. There's there's some speculation that he may have been, he may have come up with it and he punched it up. I think he definitely punched the story up for sure. Uh-huh. But there's no evidence to believe that he necessarily lied either. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those like weird gray areas where I'm not entirely sure, but. He did impose some like literal symbology of de- like devil, the devil like coming to punish them and stuff along those lines. So yeah. he was definitely he definitely had a stance for sure. <laughs> and like I said, he eventually becomes a Puritan preacher after the story is written. Yeah. So there's some speculation that it's kind of, actually this story is incredibly similar to the story of the Jersey Devil. Oh, really? In that regard. Because the Jersey Devil was literally a smear campaign, a hundred percent run against run against the leads. So I have the the hype, the hunch that this might have been similar, but the problem is because of the time frame, there's way less records kept. Yeah, and there was a giant fire in Bungay, like a couple years after this happened. So okay. there's a lot of data that was lost to time. Mm-hmm. So who knows what exactly happened? Yeah. Another key fact, and this is actually on the uh, Shuckland website that I found. Okay. And it's also, you can find it in a lot of writings and stuff like that. After this event happens, for several centuries, there's like only a handful of Shuck sightings. I just sent you the link. Shuck sightings don't really start to ramp up again until the 20th century. Shoot, okay. Yeah. So it just drops off. Well, it doesn't even drop off. It's there's literally like six sightings before the 19th century, and then it jumps up. And I have the feeling that the 20th century one or the 19th century one was related to the the story in uh, what, what is it, Ghost and Witches? Yeah. The 20th century one is very interesting because if you look at the the link I just sent you, yeah, early 20th century, it jumps up to 24 sightings. <laughs> Now, there's a key there's a key fact in this. And that's the Great Depression. Oh. So, okay. In 1935, a man by the name of Dr. Leonard King became the, a town reeve in Bungay, which is like a type of leader in Yeah. England. And he decided the town needed to be modernized because it's the Great Depression. This is the perfect opportunity to kind of revamp how the town works, rebrand the town. So he wanted to replace the dent industry. He wanted to add electricity to town and just thrust Bungay into the 20th century. Okay. However, he also realized that if he reformed Bungay as a historic town as opposed to a town with history, that would be good for bi- like good for business in general for the town. <laughs> so, uh-huh. He he resurrects uh, Castle Bungay, which at the time no one even knew that like so and so few people even knew it existed because it was so mm-hmm. overrun and had been picked clean of stones. Clean of stones. Like people were were dismantling it for paver stones. Oh man, for centuries. That's crazy. For that, centuries. That's bananas. <laughs> it's insane. It's so cool. It's such a cool story. So basically, what he does is he then realizes, oh wait. This story, he the the strange and terrible wonder, was yeah. reprinted. Oh, it was reprinted in the eighteen fifties, right? So he yeah. has this pamphlet, like a reprint of it, and he's like, "Oh, we can totally use this." <laughs> so he has a contest where he gets all the local, uh, he gets all the local elementary school students, right? Yeah, and he has them make a design involving the black shuck. Really? Because this design is going to be going on a weather vane on top of an electrical stand. (laughs) I love it. And the reason he did this, and this is so cunning, he picked kids to do it because if kids did it, people wouldn't be able to bitch at him for setting up an electrical (laughs) stand. Oh, it's clever. So yeah. clever. Like, and I'm not even like scratching the surface of what this guy did, but if uh-huh. it wasn't for him, 
Bungay wouldn't have like would be just like a a, a like a bump on the map. Yeah. Right. Like just it would not even it would be a dot. Yeah. But now we're talk we've been talking about Bungay like for like an hour. Yeah. So as a result, after this, black shuck sightings skyrocket. Now <laughs> correlation and causation, all that stuff, but let's be real on the in this yeah. particular case, suddenly the black shuck is on a water vein in the center of town. Yeah. Right? Like it's now in people's minds. On top of that, it's 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 crazy because initially people were upset about it. Now they took the, the weather vane down for repairs. Yeah. People were upset when it took longer than expected. <laughs> Phenomenal. I, I love it. Like, and now the Black Shuck is like a part of the cultural zeitgeist in a way. Like, yeah. there's a band from England, the, the the Darkness, which I think you've probably heard of, right? Hell yeah. Yeah. They have Hell a song yeah. called Black Shuck. Really? Yeah. It's it's pretty good. Shoot. Um, they've got a song called Black Shuck. Uh, they've the got Black a song Shuck. called A Thing Called Love, which was so good. It is a good song. Um, the Hound of the Baskervilles. Hell yeah. It was not actually, it probably wasn't based on the Black Shuck. Just a general black dog myth. But I think it was most likely based on black dogs. Yeah. But, you know, like hellhounds, um, things of that nature. There's just so many things in the cultural zeitgeist now revolving around black dogs in general. And in particular, Black Shuck definitely gets a mention just because Black Shuck is pretty freaking awesome, in my opinion. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, let's be real, though. I don't think that the Black Shuck is a real animal. I don't think it's a spirit. I don't think it's a demon. It's way more likely that it's a large dog. Way, yeah. Like, yeah. Not every case of it. It's way more likely it's a large dog. It's way more likely it's some form of misidentification. Someone's seeing something. Um, I saw a picture recently on Reddit, and I I linked it to you in, in, in Skype. Yeah. Uh, dogs can get big, and dogs at night can be terrifying. <laughs> like, even when you know what kind of dog it is, they can be scary. And like, kind of going back. Yeah, that's a bear. That's got no. That's a dog. No, oh, it's that's a bear. a bear. That's a bear. That's a dog. That's a dog. So that dog is a bear. Like it's as big. A... It's a large dog. Well, well, look at the size. If you look at the size of it compared to the uh, uh, the passing lane strips, it's huge. It is a huge yeah. dog. So that that yeah. is as wide as just about. It's a little bit shorter than one of a lane. Yeah. Like one lane, and that's like uh, I used to know this. Uh, I think eight feet. It's a big dog. That's a so, big dog. I, I think it's a wolf in this case, but still, the fact remains that holy shit. And then there's English mastiffs and wolfhounds and things along those lines. So dogs can get huge, and you're in marshland, so yeah. it's really easy for a dog to just disappear. But you know. I think ultimately it's important this story because it's a part of the culture of Eastern England. It's yeah. massively important. I, I legitimately think it's an interesting story. I think the cultural context that it provides is astoundingly useful. And I, I fully think that this is a great part of history. Oh, whether yeah. it's whether it's real or not, that's something that the individual person has to decide. I mm -hmm. personally side with the not real, but listen. At the end of the day, if you think this is an interesting story, if you take something from it, what does it matter? You know? Yeah. And no, as totally. long as as long as you're not like this is one of those things where it's not like uh, some of the more dangerous beliefs. If you believe in a in the fact that the black shuck exists, I'm not going to take that from you. It's not like you're endangering the lives of anyone else. If anything, you're a little you, you become a little too afraid at night if you're in uh, Eastern England. <laughs> I'm still just distracted watching that picture. Oh, that... it's crazy! It's it's huge. It's a huge it's, dog. It's imagine a bear 
that was that was sheared like you took a black bear an american black bear and just mm-hmm. trimmed its fur shorter that's the size of this dog it's wild. It's absolutely wild. So yeah, I don't think I have anything else for this episode. I, I think I think this is a probably a good point to stop. Yeah. Some quick plugs. As always, you can find us on cryptopediacast.com. Our Instagram is at cryptopediacast. And as our Twitter is also at cryptopediacast. Uh, we have a SoundCloud. Right now it only has a trailer on it. Soundcloud.com slash cryptopedia dash podcast. Uh, you can email us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com. We've got a Facebook group, which you can join if you want. You have to ask us before you join, just so we can prevent, you know, spam bots and all that stuff. Additionally, if you're listening to this on Podbean or our website, you can always look for us on any podcatcher at Cryptopedia. So just search Cryptopedia and you'll find us. Additionally, there's links on our website for Google Play, iTunes. We should be up on Spotify now. We're also on Stitcher. Pretty much anywhere you can look for podcasts. My Instagram is donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon, capital C, capital B. You can find me on Instagram at mu2057. And as always, I post a lot of pictures of cats. Uh, You can find my Twitter at JF Dunham. My website is still currently defunct. So eventually you'll get some cool, cool games. And you can email me at john at cryptopediacast.com. Both of us, both of us can be found on the website. All of our contact information could be there. So if you don't really feel like typing it out, just visit the website and scroll on down to the host section. And if you click any of those links, it'll take you to where you need to go. And as always, our podcast art is done by Tom Hill. His Instagram is Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. I'm John. I'm Brandon. And as always, things are going to get weird. that one that was a good one i like the story i'm i'm so glad to have that out of my brain <laughs> i have been i can imagine this has been clunking around in my brain for two weeks i wanted to get it out last week when we recorded fairies but my yeah. book wasn't here yet and if i hadn't done that if i hadn't waited for this book i would have missed out on like the meat and potatoes <laughs> yeah. this book was phenomenal it was worth every penny how many sticky... Like, I see tabs in there. It looks like the entire length of that book is just about covered in the uh, the sticky tags. Well, because every page had something great, and I forgot to buy a new highlighter, so I had, but I had sticky tags. <laughs> that was a lot less humor-oriented, I feel like, that episode. Well, it's, I was more just listening. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I think the story was so interesting that it, like, yeah. it was hard to make jokes about it just because it's just like... Well, there's there's an actual narrative. I'm just writing down. I've got my trusty, my field notes, so nice. I can make a little note to myself. But also, look how far back this chair reclines. No one should ever go back this far in a desk chair. What? What? It's hard. It goes back hard enough for you have to do like a legit sit up. That's it. horrifying. That's also an amazing chair. <laughs>